Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Mitchell Levy. Uh, I will tell you all about Mitchell in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is the show that deals with the soft stuff, which is too often dismissed. You know, it's the caring, the commitment, the compassion we show for others. And when you do it as a leader, and you will discover that Mitchell is, uh, you do it with a good heart, open heart, open spirit, bring people together for common cause. Mitchell Levy, welcome to Grace Under Pressure. John, great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Uh, Mitchell is a two-time TEDx speaker, among many things. He is also what we call a credibility expert, which is what we're going to explore. And he has the street cred to prove his credibility. Uh, <clears throat> he's um, created the Credibility Nation, a community. And we'll learn all about that. He's also a serial entrepreneur, which means he keeps starting new businesses. And for fortunately for him and for us, they are successful. He's provided to strategic consulting to hundreds and hundreds of companies uh, and been happily married for 31 years. I like that. And prior to COVID, he spent his summers in, in Europe. So, you know, he's doing something right. Anyway, welcome, Mitchell. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today, sir. So. John, I'm, I'm uh, am enjoying getting to know you better over time in our previous conversations. I'm absolutely looking forward to this one. Well, thank you, Mitchell. Uh, flattery will get you everywhere. We might even go an extra minute there, Mitchell. <laughs> no, no, you're talking about research. We need to make sure it stays under 30 minutes. Okay. So you explore credibility. And I'll just, um, I have a, I believe it's, it's a word we don't use enough of. And I think that so often when, you, and you know this from your consulting, that when an organization hires someone new, especially a senior leader from the outside, he is competent and he has self-confidence, or she has self-confidence, but what they lack is credibility. They have a resume, but it's new to the firm. So what is credibility from your perspective, Mitchell? So oh, I'm, I'm, enjoying, um, I'm enjoying dissecting your, your question, but let's just focus on what I found from the research and then we'll go back to the, the question. Yeah. Credibility is the quality in which you are trusted, known, and liked. And so having interviewed uh, 500 thought leaders on credibility, it's now over 600. What I recognized is that the definition in the dictionary is only one-third accurate. It worked at a point in time where we had gatekeepers. The gatekeepers were the people who, the book publishers, who we were going to read, the music producers, who we were going to listen to, the broadcast studios, who we were going to watch on TV. And when they said the word credibility, what they meant was, hey, you could trust this person by my product. Ah. So what's interesting today is, yes, it's important to trust. So if you meet somebody, if you're watching this, this video for the first time, in the first couple seconds, do you trust Mitchell enough to solve that problem so you want to get to know him better? And by the way, uh, 30 minutes is an amazing amount of time. You can get to know somebody better in, in even five once you start getting to know me, you're going to make decisions of whether you like me. And credibility is that quality. And so, John, there are 10 elements or 10 skill sets associated with the, the trust, know, and like. And I, and I cover those in, in a TED Talk I did and, and, and in the book. And we could talk about that, but there's so many other cool things to talk about. Cool. Well, to me, credibility, and I endorse your uh, description of credibility. To me, when I say someone from the outside comes into an organization, um, they are not yet known. So they are not yet believed and they have to prove themselves. That was my, is that your perspective too, Mitchell? Well, that's, well, that's absolutely right. When somebody new comes in, you may trust them because somebody who you like hired them, but you still don't know them and you certainly can't like them because you haven't met them. Mm -hmm. And so to get to know somebody, it, do they have the intent and commitment to do the right thing? Are they servant leaders? Oh. Right. And, and so, and, and do they have integrity in this particular case on being known? It's your internal integrity. <laughs> mm. What is, so what is internal integrity? Ah. <clears throat> So, John, this was one of those fascinating things. Of the 10 skill sets, there's only one that I included twice, and, and it's integrity. So I have integrity under the, under the, the column or, or, or under the pillar of being known. I also have it under the pillar of being trusted. As I was doing the research, I didn't really know why integrity was there twice. 
And it was literally about nine months after the book was out, the, the TEDx was out for about six months. And I had all these conversations. I kind of woke up one morning. I go, I got it. <laughs> I know why integrity is there twice. <laughs> so the interesting part is under being trusted, what you typically see is somebody's external integrity, like mm. who they are, how they show up in the world, how they interact with others, what their engagement is. Under being known, it's the internal integrity. Do they cheat on their diet? Do they cheat on their spouse? Do they do they cheat on their taxes? Do they do things that other people do and they think is okay, but it helps you decide? So I've heard many a story of people where people were trust experts or 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 people focused on being in high level spots, but then they cheated on their spouse or even a politician. You know, externally, they could be amazing. But if you then do things that into your, in your internal life and you're thinking it's OK because it's just me. But if you're a politician, you've given up the that ability to, to be able to have your inter internal integrity is also shared externally. It's interesting. So I think there's that leads to you've mentioned the topic of trust. And is there a link? What's the link between credibility and trustworthiness? So. Oh, so it's it to me, it's one third. So if you look at the, the definition of the dictionary today, it says credibility is the quality in which is, one is trusted. But I'm going to say it's trust, no one like. Um, the, the link is simply when, when you initially meet somebody. So given that you and I are both in the 100 coaches, we will immediately trust each other, at least a little bit. And then, then we're going to want to get to know each other. So let me give you the four skills associated with trust. It's being authentic. It's having the external integrity. It's being vulnerable. And guess what? It's also being coachable. It's being uh, coachable. Yes. Coachable. Okay. Well, it was, it was kind of surprising. I will. One of the things that happened, and this is very true for executive coaches. Um, one of the things that happened is during the interviews, there was a guy who I was interviewing. And, and typically when I, when I do the interviews, the end result is to, 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 in essence, ask five questions in five minutes. So the real power of the interviews is the green room conversations where I help, I help the interviewee get clarity on their purpose and, and how they show up in the world. And so there was one guy, I said, what is your CPOP? What is your customer point of pain? It's a CPOP is a way you could express your purpose in 10 words or less. And he responded with a 30 second response. Now, most people are one to three seconds. So I said, oh, you know, most people say who they serve and the pain point they address. And then he came back with a 15 second response. So then I said that question that as executive coaches, we always have to ask, do you mind if I do a little bit of coaching? Now, his response surprised me. He said, yes, I do. I have my way of doing things and you have yours and I don't want to learn yours. Mm -hmm. And so, by the way, just, just to finish that story, what I was excited about um, is I was smart enough not to let the initial thought that came to my head come out of my mouth. And I left a two second sort of pause. And he was, he then responded and said, you know, I don't think this is going to work between the two of us. And I go, I agree. I don't think we're going to do an interview today. Good luck with everything you do. Upon reflection, John, here's what I was thinking about myself. If you're hiring an executive for an organization, I sat on the board of a public company. So if you, if we're hiring somebody for the executive team, do I want to hire somebody who may not listen to the CEO or maybe they'll listen to the CEO, may not listen to their, any of your employees, may not listen to any staff, may not listen to customers because they know the right thing to do? The answer, of course, is no. And that's when I recognize coachable or coachability needs to be one of the skill sets associated with credibility. Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you talked about that. But coach, coachability and framing it is um, it takes you had mentioned this earlier, a sense of vulnerability. It also takes courage and in the sense that the courage to look inward. And, you know, if you ask me how I am, Mitchell, I'll say I'm just fine. You know, and um, if you're my coach, you're going to probe and find out what's going right in my life. But more especially, you're going to find out what are my obstacles and how, how you can help me. But I have to be forthright and honest with you to really talk about that and be willing to 
Well, first of all, to surface it. And then the next step is, what am I going to, you're going to say, what are you going to do about it? And I'll go, I don't know. You're the coach. <laughs> so, um, so this coachability, I, I like that perspective on it because it's, it is really vulnerability. So. Yes. It, it is actually, it's, it's surprising to me because I guess maybe it's not so surprising because we've been taught, we've been taught that, Hey, we, it, particularly if we're a leader, we know the answer and we should actually give the answer and this is the way to go. And, and there are times once a decision is made to help lead the charge forward. Mm -hmm. That said, as a leader, your team may know an answer that's significantly better than the one that you're going to come up with off the top of your head. And so being able to say, listen, there are so many different paths to go and start polling your team, which would work for you. And right. sometimes, by the way, you go, I have an answer. And if somebody comes up with a better one, as a leader, the best thing you could do is say, I like your, your answer better than mine. Let's go with yours. Well, even better is not to surface your idea first <laughs> and canvas the room. And Agreed. Uh, Agreed. because so too often, and you know this from your consulting, that when the boss speaks, um, everything else is framed versus what the quote versus what the boss said so um i always try to coach people and i'm sure you do the same thing is what's what are people thinking if no one steps forward then you know uh how about this and that kind of stuff and again that it, it takes um i would go another dimension of vulnerability by inviting others to go first because the you know leader is served last so Agreed. So now you have interviewed 600 thought leaders on credibility. So what what has all this taught you or what have you gleaned from this? Because you've written a book on it. But what are the what's the what are the key takeaways for our audience? So, you know, the the first, let's do the macro level. I ended up doing a TED talk called we are losing our humanity and I'm tired of watching it happen. Uh, it Good turned time. out it Good was, I, I found out, uh, thank you, by the way, for that. And I found out a, a week ago, it was the 28th most popular TEDx that was released in uh, 2021. And what it focuses on is if we want to bring back our humanity, all we have to do is act credible. And it just talks about the components of credibility. So that was a macro level. I picked up a life goal, my life goal, my life mission. I'm going to, I'm going to show you a picture is to tip the scale between those in the world that are credible <laughs> and those that are dubious. Ah, this is a, this is something that we, we need to do. It can't be something I can do. It's we have to do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm going to, um, I like that uh, graphic and I like the sense of dubious, but I regard doubt um, as in, as uncomfortable as it is, and particularly framed as self doubt, um, that's a protective mechanism for individuals. Um, and so, doubt is not an always a negative. It's uncomfortable, but it's not a negative. What What is your perspective when you say dubious nation? So, uh, so what happened when I realized what my overarching, what my bigger goal, what my life purpose needs to be? It was almost easy for me to come up with Credibility Nation. Here's a place where people who want to learn and grow and surround themselves with other people to be credible, that I need to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do a movement, movements need an arch rival. They need a nemesis. And, and so I was thinking about physical people or physical locations. And then I realized, you know, the, the biggest issue I have here is I don't, I, I, people change over time. So it can't be a person or a place or a thing. And the other thing that's interesting is to be dubious is not always a bad thing. Right. Because it, it is okay to, to be dubious about a, a way to go because you're just not sure. Dubious does not imply malevolent or mischievous. Dubious just means that it's not the right answer. And most of the time what happens with dubious is people are telling you things that worked for other people or in the past, they've watched research results or, or applied things with a particular client type. And they say, you have to do this because I know this will work. That's a dubious statement because it may not work for this person in this situation. So 
Dubious Nation is the arch rival of Credibility Nation. What's important to re realize, though, is that we, most of us are some amount of dubious every day, right? And, mm -hmm. and so I may be dubious. And what happens if I do something that's dubious, do something that's silly? Do I either self-correct or have I surrounded myself with accountability partners? And when they say something, I'm vulnerable enough and attentive enough to listen, to recognize I made a mistake and change. And so what I want people to recognize, it's not a heaven or hell. It's not a right or wrong. It's not a red or blue. It's not 100% credible, 100% dubious in most cases. And so when we step in to do things and we step over the bound or step on the landmine, you know, it's, it's how do we self-correct? Well, that, it, it, good. That's a great insight. So um, what do you think are the obstacles of the interviewed 600 people on this topic? So what are the big obstacles to credibility? Do you think from what does your research tell you, Mitchell? So. Number one is clarity. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you the biggest picture. Uh, uh, we'll give you two clarity and momentum. And so what I mean by momentum is so many people will tell you they know the answer. And, oh, we'll give you three. Our, our <laughs> Thank you for this question, because it's not one that's prepared, right? So clarity, <laughs> momentum, and our existing educational system. Yep. Right? Because we're, we're, we don't train people to be credible. We train people to be cogs in a wheel, right? That's what, that's what our current educational yeah. system does. So on the clarity part, what was shocking to me is that 98% of those people I interviewed could not articulate their purpose. 98% could not articulate who they served and the pain point they addressed in 10 words or less. Right. And when I say that to other people who are knowledgeable, they go, yeah, that's about right. And I didn't know. I, I mean, I literally didn't until I did started the research and started getting the feedback. I did not know. So how can you be credible if you're doing a job, but you don't like it, or you're doing a job and you don't know if this is really in your heart, you're doing it because you've done it before and you know it works. Credibility, as you mentioned, a new leader coming on board, you, you may trust them because they got put in a position and you want to help. They want to build that trust over time. But as you get to know that person, you get to decide whether or not you really know them and you like them and that they're those that leader who's credible that you will follow uh, to the ends of the earth, if they're not, if they don't know what their purpose is, if they don't know what they're there, if they're doing it as a job to make money and something else is more important, they're not going to seem credible to you. So that's the clarity of who you are and how you serve, probably most important. Momentum is simply that there are rules and approaches that people do based on empirical evidence of in the past. And they say, always do this. And we need to start questioning with the fact that all the information, we, we have a computer that's here that is more powerful than the ENIAC, first computer ever made. And we need to be discerning on the information we receive and how we receive it and how we process it. So if somebody says, go there and do this, you need to say, well, are you saying that because you think that's relevant for me? Or are you saying that because you've seen it in the past we are saying it because you guessed. And so that's the momentum piece. Okay. Um, great. Clarity and momentum. I do like those ideas because I mean, they are obvious, but they obfuscate us. So often, as you firsthand discovered, so when you ask people about their purpose, they struggled with it. And it is a difficult proposition, too. And, and so I know I struggled with defining it for myself. And the momentum is that I, I like the idea of momentum is movement. And I like to think of momentum as forward motion may not always be that way but <laughs> let us hope we go there with and, and that it feeds upon itself and it gets stronger certainly in the idea of emotion so um what is that um i'm just uh, about clarity um when if i tell you if i'm if i'm you're coaching me and i'm struggling with our um, framing or articulating what my a goal, my purpose is, what advice do you give me? Mm. So we'll give you the, the, 
the marketing answer, then the real answer. So marketing answer uh, in the book, Credit Boy Nation, I actually walked through it. In the community, Credit Boy Nation, there's a half hour course, right? That helps you walk through it. What, let's just, let's spend two minutes, if you don't mind. I'll, I, and I'll just give you some thoughts to think about because this is a, one of the things that's interesting, this is a trainable skill. Being able to pull out somebody's true purpose in life and to be able to have clarity is absolutely a trainable skill. And so the, it, the, the way I, I call it a CPOP, a customer point of pain. Now you could, you could label it a customer point of pleasure, a customer point of profit, but I call it a CPOP. Mm -hmm. And the CPOP, mine, for instance, is simply four words. Businesses that feel invisible. Now, when you hear a CPOP, what, what you want to be, you, you, if, if I share that with you, John, you're one of three people. You're either, oh, my God, that's me, Mitchell. That's a playground I want to play in. Tell me more. Or, you know, I'm a servant leader. There are other people who I know who, who would find that useful. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me more so I could share it with them. Or it could be, I, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean I don't care about you, but that's not for me now. Mm -hmm. So when you create a CPOP, it, it's essentially you're stating the playground you play in. It typically starts with who you serve and as fine-tuned as you can. Like a lot of people do, speakers, authors, coaches, consultants, that's more than four words by itself. Like pick one, right? Pick something. The second thing is what is that primary pain point? In some cases, it could be an aspiration point. But what is that primary pain point they're addressing? And you want to do it in such a way where you say those words, it makes people smile. It mm. makes people want to ask for the next thing, which then could be your value proposition. Okay. And so, I'll, yeah. Sorry. No, okay. we have a question from a listener, Joe, who is a faithful watcher. And thank you, Joe. Um, he said, what is the obstacle? What's the biggest obstacle to credibility? And he said, is it um, self-centeredness or lack of care or what do you think Mitchell so. oh that's a great that's a great question you know it, it's I'm not sure it's either although there certainly could be components of both mm -hmm. I think the self-centered things we're we're taught to make the the universe revolve around us that's typically part of our ed education system and how people are brought up and, and that narcissistic hedonistic approach that many people have, which clearly is, is not right. What, what, not, it comes me, to, not. <laughs> not, not you, sir. So yeah. under being known, one of the skill sets is being a servant leader. Mm. And so I would say one of the obstacles, if, if you're, if you're taught wrong. So for me, my first boss out of, out of business school, taught me how to be hedonistic and narcissistic and it took 36 that years like actually fun uh, <laughs> oh man it was the op it turns out i you know it, it took me 36 years to unlearn all the lessons he taught me <laughs> you know and, and it was really fascinating so what's the biggest obstacle maybe having the desire to be vulnerable enough to be self-aware and then coming at it with a very strategic point of view and it's based on the previous question is i think it starts with clarity who okay. are we now uh, i want to get a drill down question in the tactical and practical which is especially uh top of mind for anyone on linkedin you have reviewed some one hundred thousand linkedin profiles so what makes one profile versus another or i don't know if it's versus but credible you know, it's um, many people treat LinkedIn like a resume. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing that, by definition, you, you, it's not good. And and I would say over 90 percent of LinkedIn profiles look more like resumes than they look like who you are. Right? Definitely. Yeah. So what I would say when I first look, it's first impressions. When I first look at a LinkedIn profile, there are three things that I'll see. There's a banner in the background. Lots of people use the standard, like they don't put an image there. So you want to put an image there and you want that image to reinforce your purpose, right? The second is the picture of you. Some people put pictures that are 10 plus years old, or if you don't have a picture, there's a, there's a, there's a particular uh, thing you could check on LinkedIn that says, if I'm not connected to the person, don't show me the picture. Well, I'll never be connected to you if there's not a picture. So therefore, it seems it means you don't want to meet new people. So I would never meet you. 
right? Just to be clear, to me, that's an uncredible or a not so credible. And then I also look at the, the tagline that people use. Now, some people just put their title today. What I'd like to have you see in there is I want to see your purpose. I want to see, oh. in this case, I want to see your CPOP. And, mm -hmm. and then, then the, the next thing I'm going to do, if, if you do enough that I want to look no more, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom where it shows your recommendations and your endorsements. And I'm going to see whether or not those top three things that, that people have endorsed you on, whether or not your audience says that those three things are in alignment with your with your CPOP, with your customer point of pain. So <laughs> me, that, that's the first thing I look at. Ah, that's great. That's a good good self check. You know, are are you well? And it's very basic, simple. Are you walking the talk, or are you coming across the way you want to come across? Because the the quote consumer is the ultimate judge of your credibility. So. Uh, which were full circle there. Uh, <clears throat> Mitchell, we're coming, we're racing along here quickly. Um, as you know, I always ask us uh, folks for a story of grace. Do you have one that you wish to share? So, you know, I don't know if it's similar to, I don't know if it's similar or completely different than other people. But as I started thinking about this question, I'm going to say I live with grace, although her name's not grace. It's with my wife. <laughs> and, I got lucky enough to meet her at a time in life where, where she is, I would just view her as my angel. As a matter of fact, the first time I saw her, the sun was behind her head and she had a halo around her. Now, I think it's because she's an angel. She thinks it's because the sun was there and, and there was some, something in my glasses at the time, right? Yeah. Um, and, and I'd say the, the, the particular things I've learned, the way I practice who I am, how our son has grown up, there's so many elements of that that comes from a person. And, and the reason I say this now more than anything else, credibility is all about living with, with good values. It's what mom and grandma used to teach us. Mm -hmm. and, and my wife is a element of that. And she is... She is my grace. And before her, I particularly because I was so many different things in, in, in life. But I, I had that that bad mentor um, who taught me how to be hedonistic <laughs> and narcissistic. And I I had someone who was graceful enough to be able to share with me that there are better ways to be a human. Oh, what a what a wonderful story and what a wonderful tribute to your spouse, your wife. So uh, what a special person. So and that, you know, that gets to the point is that um, grace is a gift. It's the we are taught if there are no strings attached and you're the beneficiary of that. And I know in your work, in your work in credibility, you are finding ways to uh, turn it around and give it back to others. And, and that's important. So uh, she's had a positive influence on you, Mitchell. I'll say that. So great. So uh, Mitchell, how can people find you? Um, you know, the, if this is of interest and you want to explore credibility nation, um, go over there. It's just credibilitynation.com. And if it's appropriate and you want to spend time uh, on the calendar together, just go to mitchelllevy.com and you could go to the contact us and book time directly on the calendar. And I look forward to interacting with you. My goal, as, as I said at the beginning, is to help more people understand what is credibility and how help companies figure out how to create a culture of credibility. And so I'm absolutely looking forward to having those conversations. And, and John, I'm sure you and I will work on a project along those lines sometime soon as well. Absolutely. And I would encourage folks to check out um, Mitchell's um, profile uh, on LinkedIn because the proof will be in the pudding. <laughs> and so we'll find that. So uh, Mitchell, I know you're extremely busy on a lot going on. So um, I am honored that you would uh, spend time with us today. And I say thank you. So you're absolutely welcome, John. Thanks for having me. And I, I love uh, an interviewer who asks questions that come as, as you move along and it, it, it shows a lot about you and you did a great job. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah.